If you enjoy Astronomy FM Radio, please let us know with a small donation. We do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. You're listening to AFM Radio on Astronomy.FM, around the world and beyond. Arr. Coming up next, it's time for an AFM Radio original program, Space Pirate Radio, brought to you by the voice of astronomy, matey. This is Astronomy.FM. The pirates are coming, the pirates are coming, the pirates are coming, you better watch out. Arr, it's Space Pirate Radio Times, Buckos here on Astronomy.fm Radio. It is another Wednesday evening, and this one happens to be December the 6th, 2017, 9 o'clock in the evening for those of us here in the eastern portion of North America. So that would make it universal time right now at 2 o'clock in the morning, Thursday morning, December the 7th, 2017. Hoping uh, Captain Diane will be able to join us. She's had a little technical difficulty. She's hammering away at Skype right now with a hammer trying to trying to board the ship here so yes nothing like nothing like an upgrade to wipe out all of your saved information don't we all just love computers so very very much well hopefully she'll be able to uh um get back into uh our skype connector and get back on even if it's a little bit later in the evening that'll be just fine so we'll see how it goes i want to say hi to everybody that's in chat right right now i've got uh glenn optronics uh Diane's in chat, Plaid Joan, Aquafuse, Sister Plaid, Black Projects, Evil Spock, so far. Come on and join us in the chat room. Go just go to the homepage, astronomy.fm, and look where it says radio chat. You can click on that. Get you to the login page. And then you could uh, just type in type in a name you want to be called by. Nothing, no big deal. Hit login and you'll be here in our chat room. If you want to ask me a question about astronomy, I'll be more than happy to attempt to answer your question live on the air as soon as I get a chance to read it and think about it a little bit so i'll do my best come on over the chat anyways everybody especially like it when people uh um, come in from all around the world uh, from different places that we haven't had people in chat for a while so sometimes we get people in chat from uh, um, uh, different countries and in off hours but uh, this is the best time where i'm really really looking at uh, the chat room right now and uh to answer your questions during this live portion. Don't forget, we repeat this program every four hours for the next 24 hours, so you might catch me on uh, one of the repeats. And I'm usually not in chat during the repeat time, though, sometimes. Now, if you are in chat in the off time, stick around for a while. You never know, somebody might just join. You can talk a little astronomy stuff if you like to. I do see once in a while uh, I go back in the, in the logs and see people I have uh, come on into chat, uh, you know, 5, 10, 12 hours ago, stuff like that. So, Feel free to come on in and stick around and say hello. Well, it's uh, well, I was looking at the sun. Well, no, I wasn't looking at the sun. I was looking at an image of the sun from the uh, Soho Space Probe, and not a sunspot at all on the sun. Been like five days without a sunspot. Oh, sad is that? Getting to be a real trend. I uh, had somebody report to me a few days ago that, yeah, even in H alpha. A hydrogen and alpha, a special type of telescope that a lot of amateurs have to look at the sun. They were not seeing any activity either uh, on the sun, which you could usually almost always see a prominence or a little bit of activity on the surface of the sun. No, it's just blank, dead, almost almost nothing. We still get some occasional magnetic fields opening up on the surface of, or in the atmosphere of the sun. Once in a while, we do get some particles streaming through space, and they will hit uh, the Earth's um, atmosphere around the magnetic poles and and get some uh, auroral activity going on, almost nonstop auroral activity coming out of the sun, even during the quiet sunspotless times also. I think we're just kind of leaving a uh, uh, kind of a storm flow lately, so we might end up with uh, some... A little bit of aurora, another day or so, and then that's going to be it until something else opens up. So right now it is looking like a pretty gloomy uh, solar observation time to do stuff like that. Of course, I was just saying this uh, same report to our astronomy club meeting a few days ago. And I was thinking, you know what? It's time for me to start looking for things going in front of the sun that are orbiting the Earth satellites, and especially, of course, the International Space Station. There's a website called 
Cal Sky, C A L S K Y. You can look it up, type in your coordinates, and it will let you know when uh, the space station is going to fly in front of the sun from um, a certain amount of miles. You, you designate how far away from your observing location. So that's still a good project for for observing the sun is to watch the space station fly in front of it. It is pretty small. Uh, you might want to try going to uh, solarastronomy.org. It's our buddy Stephen Ramsden's website. He has several pictures of uh, the space station flying in front of the sun. You can get an idea how small it is. And sometimes you'll see multiple images of the space station. So there might be, you know, a dozen, 15 images. Well, that's a, a video composite. But that'll give you, if you count, you know, if there's like 24 frames in a second and then there's only, you know, 20 of those space station images going across the sun, that means, yeah, it was about uh, three quarters of a second it takes for the space station to fly in front of the sun. Uh, pretty tough catching it. So you can see it observationally, of course, with the solar filter. But you better figure out almost exactly when it's going to go and then look at it and then don't give up. That's a difficult part. Because even if you look away, obviously, for a second and then look back in your eyepiece, it could be gone. You could just, you know, one second of the space station flying in front of the sun is really, really fast. So that's one of the reasons most people just hook a video camera up to the scope um, you know, watch the monitor. Maybe you'll see it go across the monitor. If not, then you know review that that uh, video several times, and maybe you'll actually be able to to catch it that way. Probably one of the easiest ways, because if you if you're just staring through your telescope for several minutes, well, it could it could have happened just before you looked in the telescope. It could happen just after you looked in the telescope. And like I said, not much of a blink to to miss it. So. Uh, if you shoot some video and you know you can watch it, uh, maybe you know give yourself a good fifteen twenty minute window, of pointing your your scope at the sun with a filter and a video camera, and then you can review that film or that video several times, and uh, maybe catch it catch it that way. So if you didn't catch it the first time, remember it, it is pretty small, going across the face of the sun. So that's the project I'm going to be doing. I'll start looking up uh, Cal Sky. Now you have to kind of Go on the site. It's only good for a little while. It times out. So go on, get your information, uh, look and see, I think, whatever parameters they give you. If they only give you about a week to uh, to look it up and then go back in next week and check it again, next week and check it again, stuff like that. So give it a shot. You can also get uh, calculations of when the space station is going to go in front of the moon also. And even in front of major planets. So it's possible to see space station going across uh, one of the planets. It's pretty rare, and um, you, it's it's pretty really really rare from one location. So you're gonna have to get used to uh, maybe wanting to travel a hundred miles or more, something like that, in order to be able to get a chance to see it. So. Give it a shot. A good project during these uh, really quiet solar times. There's no spots, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's one solar project, at least, you could try to do. And pretty much good for a wide range of latitudes. The uh, space station, I think, gets up to about 55 degrees north and south latitude, something like that. So that covers... Most of the comfortable observing world. So give that a shot. Uh, all right, still working on Diane. We'll see what happens if she can get in or not. Let's uh, let me give you a little rundown on what's happening with uh, the moon and planets, stuff like that. Coming up on Friday, December the eighth. Um, for most of the world, the moon will be really close to Regulus, uh, less than a degree away, and there will be an occultation. Let me go to one of my other websites for that. i got two websites for this. Uh, so you will be able to see um, the moon go in front of Regulus at Alpha Leo on December the 8th if you're in northern Europe and northern 
Asia. I've got a couple websites for that. Uh, one is called uh, lunar-occultations.com. So check that one out. They give the whole a whole year's worth of uh, occultation. So this one is good through the end of the year, December 30th. And then it'll uh, upgrade to, to next year. So let's see. We've got an occultation on, uh, give it the, getting down to the end here, December the 15th, Gamma Libra. Um, that'll be visible from Northwest uh, U.S. and Southwest Canada on December 30th. Oh, there's four of them on December 30th. Um, Gamma Taurus, visible from Northern Asia and Northern Europe. Uh, that, that's not an omega. I don't know what this sign is. It's, mm, I have to look it up. Well, anyways, there's, the moon's going to go in front of a star uh, that's visible from South Africa and Madagascar. Uh, I think this one's, is it Omicron, Taurus, December 30th, be visible from Northern Europe and Northern Asia. And then finally, Alpha Taurus again, that's uh, Aldebaran, visible from Eastern United States, Eastern Canada, Greenland, and Northern Europe. Of course, uh, we won't have any, we won't have any shows around that weekend between the, uh, um, uh, New Year's and uh, the week before that. So we'll uh, get that information to you again next week. But expect uh, right around the end of the year, we won't have any uh, radio shows. We'll be just playing a variety of music if you want to listen to stuff like that. Uh, what else is coming out? All right, Sunday, we've got uh, Last Quarter Moon. We just had a nice full full moon. And the full moon happens to have been occurring at its closest point in its orbit. So, yeah, we kind of grungingly call that a super moon. Uh, well, while I'm on it, there's actually going to be three supermoons in a row. So let's see. It's uh, this one in, in uh, December, a few days ago, December 3rd. I think it was a was a, a full moon supermoon. It's going to be one around. Is it the first of January? I'm thinking, and then the 31st of January. Let me pop this. Up. Yep, uh, December 3rd. 1st of January, and then January 31st. January 31st, full moon, super moon. Uh, it's kind of a very unusual one. Hopefully you'll be able to get a chance to see that one. It's going to be a super moon. It's going to be the second full moon in a month, sometimes referred to as a blue moon. And it's also going to be, there's going to be a lunar occult a lunar eclipse, sorry, not occultation, lunar eclipse when the moon goes into the shadow of the earth. So that's, we could call that a, a how about a, calling it a royal moon that's been suggested because it's going to be a blue moon and a red moon, blue blood moon, January 31st. Uh, mostly the United States is going to mostly miss it. Uh, I think the extreme western United States We'll be able to catch the uh, lunar eclipse as it's setting. Uh, I think I might catch here in the eastern portion, I might catch a partial lunar eclipse, but certainly not the total phases will be gone for me. But most of uh, Europe, Africa, Asia will be able to catch that. Uh, we'll call it a super royal moon. How about that? Uh, let's see. All right, well, and we had more more stuff coming up too. Let's see. We've got uh, next Wednesday. Mercury is in inferior conjunction. So if you didn't see Mercury uh, last week, yeah, you're going to be getting out of luck because it's going to be uh, uh, not in front of the sun, but it's going to be passing either due north or due south of the sun. Uh, that's what they call inferior conjunction. So that means it's basically at the same declination as the sun. Um, but because the Earth's orbit and Mercury orbit don't completely line up, it's a little bit off. So it always passes, it mostly always passes a little bit north of the sun or a little bit south of the sun. And, and just rarely our orbits um, cross paths and Mercury will be there in front of the sun. And yes, we actually get to see Mercury transit across the face of the sun, but not this time. That's a pretty rare event. Also next Wednesday, uh, the moon will be uh, about four degrees from the planet Mars also. That's after last quarter, so getting in the morning time. 
Uh, a little bit of observing to do, checking with the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They've got a alert notice out, alert notice 608, for looking at a star called TT. Um, Aerie, Aerie is, um, oh, what's, what's Aerie? Shoot, I know what that is. I was just looking at Aer not Aeris. Um, I'll get back to it. <laughs> um I want to think Aquila. What's the other? What's the other? A Aries the Ram. That's it. Um, it's a cataclysmic variable star. That means it's basically two stars orbiting the other, orbiting each other, and one star is stripping the material off the other one. It's a close companion, and every once in a while, it, the one star that collecting the material builds up a little bit too much stuff. And then it ignites and the star gets extra bright. Doesn't go supernova. It gets that's why it's a variable star. So it gets a lot brighter than usual. Um, but this one's called a cataclysmic variable, which means that it doesn't happen regularly. It happens irregularly. There's a lot of uh, variable stars that are like this. Uh, they they collect material at a regular rate, and then basically it ignites at a regular rate, and it gets brighter at a regular rate, regular rate, and then dims dims down again. This one just kind of kind of goes boom, but not really a big boom, just kind of a boom, and then it gets dim again. Well, there's some researchers are trying to figure out um, how some of this works. What are they trying to figure out here? It was uh, um, some of the materials actually. Um, was it showing in, in radio waves or x-rays? Let's see. It produces a significant amount of radio emission. So they're trying to figure out why, when the stuff is transferring, um, why are they getting some unusual flaring of radio emissions? That's, it's different from, from other types of cataclysmic variables. Uh, let me put a link to this. Um, you can also go to the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and uh, and read it all yourself. Let me put a link to the uh, to that article into our chat room. So anybody in our chat room, it's a good reason to be there. You can just go to that link and uh, click on it and go read the article further. Well, the main point of this was that um, the American Association of Variable Star Observers are asking amateur astronomers to help look at the star because they're going to be using uh, the VLA, Very Large Array, to observe the star. So they want some optical wavelength observations to go in with the radio observations. Opti optical observations means, yes, your telescopes. They want you to look at the star with your telescopes while they are looking at it with the Very Large Array. So you can help out some astronomers with this project. Um, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, they want, let me read this here, let's see, the VLA will observe TT area twice over four hours for a total of eight hours over the period of, uh, um, the 10th to the 12th of December. So they want, they don't know exactly, it depends on the weather and stuff like that, so they want people to start monitoring the star right now. It's actually reasonably bright at about, um, 10th. 10 and a half magnitude, something like that. Right now showing it at, I think, 10.8 magnitude at the very end of December. So definitely visible in 6-inch, uh, 8, 6-and-above-inch telescope. It's in the constellation of Aries. That's pretty easy to find. It's uh, um, the bigger constellation of Pisces and the normal, uh, not, not Pisces, um, Pegasus. Easily visible this time of year in the, in the early part of the evening in the northern hemisphere, and uh, um, Aries is pretty pretty close to uh, um, Pegasus and Andromeda, so it's it's not too bad of a star. Uh, the coordinates are two hours six seconds, declination fifteen plus fifteen degrees seventeen minutes, so reasonably well placed for northern hemisphere observers. What they say, just a, a moderate sized telescope. 
So you can actually help with the science project. And it gives you a little bit of something extra to do if you want to You're going out, you know, just general scar- stargazing and looking around, pick up some of the usual Messier objects in the planets and stuff like that. A, a little bit of an extra challenge for you. If you don't want to turn in your observations, that that's okay. But I'd say go and look the star up, and then next time you go out, see if you can actually find it. Good practice. And then if you feel comfortable with it, you can actually turn in your observations and figure out how bright the star actually is uh, for these astronomers. So do a little bit of real science with your telescope, too. You'll, you'll kind of enjoy that and, and log down that you did it. So decades later, you'll say, yes, I contributed to this project. So still research going on for um, cataclysmic variable stars. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we got a few a uh, few more people into our uh, into our chat room now. We got Black Projects, Plaid Mac, Colonel Dan Dare, uh, somebody with a name I can't read it because it's uh it's a uh, it's not translated. So sorry, sorry, I don't know what that language is, but uh, welcome. Mm-hmm. Oh, it looks like uh, Optronics. Who's from uh, Buenos Aires can understand. It must be a Spanish language name. Looks like it. Can't tell. Well, anyways, welcome. Glad to have you here. Glad you're listening in. Oh, port- trying in my Portuguese. It's it. Sense a cow Portuguese. Got it. Thank you. All right. Let's see what happened. Uh, there's been some uh, chatter from Diane, but sorry, it's been kind of passing me up a little bit here. So, uh, trying to catch up on uh, a few things going in the chat room here. Well, looks like always a good conversation going in our astronomy.fm chat room. So, come on over there and, and join everybody. Uh, let's see. Did I put? Let me put this link in. I don't think I put this one in about the uh, um, lunar occultations. Mm-hmm. A good list to uh, a good list to have. I'm going to add that to your computer favorite sites. I always do. Good to see when the moon's going to go in front of something, especially for public star parties. It's a great thing to show. Uh, usually, everybody shows in a public star party. All well, the brighter planets if they're out. Not too many out right now. The moon, if it's out, well, it'd be nice to actually show them a little bit of something. Watch the moon go in front of a star. Now, it's kind of hard to do that with just your telescope because pretty much only one person can see the moon go in front of the star. Now, if it's a bright one, you know, like uh, Aldebaran or Regulus or something like that, you can um, at least tell everybody it's going to happen, kind of give a countdown of when it's going to happen. And for most of the bright ones like that, a pair of binoculars will work. Even a, a small 60 millimeter refractor, will work for a project like that. It's a good one to tell your astronomy club, if you have belong to an astronomy club, that this is going to happen a certain date and a certain time, and then people can get out and use their their, uh, their telescopes. If it's a fairly small telescope, it's a great project for a fairly small telescope because that's usually the first thing people look for with a telescope is the moon, of course. So they can find the moon, they can actually watch the moon, then they can watch this watch the moon pass in front of a star. So you, know, you get two chances about an hour apart, one going in front of the moon and one going coming from behind the moon. Uh, you can also you'll have some variables too. So for instance, uh, um, going the moon going in front of the star will either have obviously a dark edge. You'll just see the star getting close to the moon and disappear. Or you'll have a, a bright edge moon. And then the same thing on the way out. It'll pop out either from a bright edge moon or from a dark edge moon. So, uh, if it's a bright edge moon, you have a little bit better chance of figuring out where it's going to pop out from. Because usually there's some uh, diagrams around that will tell you where the star is actually going to pop out from. So you can kind of zoom in right on that part of the moon. It's a little bit easier to identify uh, craters that way. And figure out exactly where it's going to pop out so you can really zoom in and see it. When it's popping out from the dark edge of the moon, it's kind of hard to figure out where it's going to come out sometimes. So maybe a a little less power and watch it. Now, if you zoom in with too much power and you're off by just a little bit, it it might pop out from behind the moon. But 
not in the part of the moon that you're actually looking at. So a little bit more of a challenge to, when it when it pops out from a dark edge of the moon. So a good fun project, and they happen kind of regularly. So if you if you're looking at that list, uh, there's about you know a dozen or so every month. It'll go in front of a reasonably bright star lately, go in front of some first magnitude stars, but uh, most often it's something around a fourth magnitude star, something a little bit more uh, realistic can happen uh, can happen in front of some dimmer stars more than it's going to happen in front of really bright stars. But we do get some nice bright ones, and hopefully they're actually in your area. Uh, let's go to NASA a little bit. We've got a launch coming up. On uh, December the 11th, um, SpaceX CRS-13 cargo mission. Well, that's a pre-launch. Sorry, it's uh, sorry. December the 12th, same mission. SpaceX is going to go to the International Space Station. Uh, launch time should be at 11:46 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. Tuesday, December the 12th. You'll have to do a conversion for your local time for it out when that's happening. Uh, it's going to be launching from the state of Florida here in the U.S. So you can, uh, if you're living in that area, you can actually watch that launch. Or you can go to NASA TV and watch it also. Just go to, go to www.nasa.gov, G-O-V. They've got a NASA TV, and they always broadcast launches and stuff like that um, on NASA TV. So check that out next Tuesday. Well, you still got about two and a half hours to help pick a name for the next New Horizons spacecraft mission. That's the mission that just flew by Pluto. Now it's going to a uh, what's called a Kuiper Belt object, objects that are beyond the orbit of Pluto. There's a bunch of them out there. Some are big, some are smaller. So it's going to uh, one with an official designation of 2014 MU69. And they've kind of opened up uh, a bit of a, uh, a fun project for the general public to give it a nickname. And uh, the the... The uh, time limit is about two and a half hours from now. So if you're listening to this during the live portion, um, give it a shot. Give it, give it a name. There's a list of names, more popular names, that you can actually vote for one of those. Or you can basically type in your own name and submit that to I didn't read the full article on it, so I don't know if it's going to be a vote by popularity or if it's going to be some, you know, uh, some NASA staff or international, probably NASA staff that will not international astronaut. You know, this I think will be an unofficial name, so it'll be a nickname. So if you've got an idea, you might want to uh, go on there. It was pretty easy. I went on there and clicked on a couple things, and I didn't care much for the names that were there, so I, I picked my own name that I wanted to uh, to suggest to them. I picked the word Outlander. There are a lot of uh, uh, mythological names, uh, names for features, uh, like like uh, what the Mount Everest, the traditional Nepalese name of that, stuff like that. Uh, mythology characters, all kinds of all kinds of different things. So uh, vote for one of those, or or pick your own name and, and type it in. That's what I did, and we'll see uh, when they actually announce the new nickname for the object that uh, New Horizon spacecraft is going to be flying by on in uh, just about a year, January 1st, 2019. So I think it's about halfway through its mission to get there, about two years, leaving Pluto to get to uh, this rock. Uh, Not a real big rock, a little bit more than 10 miles across, something like that, 18 to 20 kilometers uh, might be two bodies out there. So we'll see. Remember when the first asteroids were first images, first image by space probes um, flying out? I can't remember some of the ones that Ida and Tactical, something like that. So interesting to see some of the first asteroids. And of course, there's a uh, 
uh, mission to some of the, um, um, uh, or to one of the, uh, what formerly a asteroid, now a uh, dwarf planet series. And that is, what is that mission? Hmm. I'm forgetting about it. I'll, I'll look it up in a bit. Uh, well, anyways, yeah, the, the probe that's orbiting around Ceres right now, um, Dwarf Planet Ceres, is still sending back information. So that was, and it went by, I think, Pallas before that. So it's still sending some interesting images. Uh, never would have thought that we would have um, actually see what those objects look like. They've always been just dots and telescopes for most of us. Now, so we've actually seen some of the uh, farther planets up close before we've seen some of these nearer objects. Well, this is actually going to be a really, really, uh, really, really far one. Yeah, somebody's, yeah, Colonel Dan Dares is Outlander, Space Marshal Sean Connery. Yeah, it's kind of what I was thinking, kind of what I was thinking. I remember the, the movie called Outlander. Kind of thinking of that, but I was thinking, you know, it's, it's a far away object, but it's not a really significant object. So I didn't think it would need something as permanent as a, you know, a uh, ancient uh, mythology name, mythological name. So I thought something like Outlander would be just good enough for something far away, but not really, really all that big. Uh, oh, and uh, oh, we've got some more people coming in. Welcome to Doug from Northern Cross Observatory. Just logged in here. All right, we're halfway through our program, so we'll do a little station identification. You are listening to Space Pirate Radio here on astronomy.fm. It is another Wednesday evening, and this one happens to be December the 6th, 2017. Uh, 9.30 in the evening for those of us here in the eastern portion of North America, also known in, uh, in universal time as December the 7th, Thursday morning, 2.30 in the morning, um, December 7th, 2017. So halfway through the program, just me tonight, Diane uh, has a little technical difficulty getting into the getting aboard ship right now, so uh, she should be back next week no problem so hopefully we'll figure out the uh, uh she can fix the upgrade yeah is it nice to get an upgrade something on your computer and have it downgrade isn't that wonderful way technology works like that not fun i know well anyways want to say hi to everybody that's in our chat room right now we've got uh optronics Diane's in our chat room. You can chat with her. Plaid Joan, Aqua for You, Black Project, Evil Spock, Plaid Mac, Colonel Dan Dare, Plaid Sister, uh, was it Sensei Cow, Glenn, and Doug from Northern Cross Observatory. Welcome, everybody. That's in chat and has been in chat tonight. Appreciate you uh, being here. If you've got a question for me, this is a great time to do it right now, right after the halfway point when I'm looking at the chat room. So if you had a chat, I uh, had a question for me in chat a little while ago. This is a good time to put in there because this is when I'm really looking at the chat room and not talking about the articles we had up earlier. So if you've got an astronomy question for me, um, go ahead and ask it. I'd be more than happy to answer for you on air as best I can, or I'll just make it up. But I'll let you know if I'm talking, giving you nonsense answers. Uh, another project I want to do here on the radio show, too, is uh, I want to give you an idea of uh, some supernova. I've like, I got a list of supernova from the uh, Rockland Astronomy Club in New York. Let me put this link into our chat room here. This is another good one for everybody to, to keep, uh, keep in your favorites list on your computer and refer to it every once in a while, especially when you're ready to go out and do some observing. They've got a supernova list. So they get all the information of supernova. Now, they list the brightest supernovas up to magnitude 19-ish or something like. Yeah, pretty. mostly they're way too dim. So they, obviously they will prioritize the brightest one, but there's a lot of supernovas going off. In fact, uh, so far in December, we're only six days into it, uh, in fact, all these are reported yesterday. One, two, three, five, four, five supernovas, magnitude 17 through 18th magnitude. So, yeah, they're pretty far, pretty faint. Uh, 
day before on the, uh, sorry, that was the 5th, uh, December the 4th, there was about a dozen supernovas reported. Again, all up around that 18th magnitude. So there are quite a few supernovas going off, even though they're, they're pretty faint. So I'll try to keep you updated on uh, just some general supernova, especially all this, the, uh, the slightly brighter ones. So what's slightly brighter? 15th magnitude, 13th magnitude, something like that. Uh, if you have uh, photography equipment, and you can kind of uh, get down to that magnitude. And you can, another project you can do when you're doing astrophotography is uh, give a shot, look for, uh, look for and look at some supernova. Now, if you're also using uh, one of the uh, rental telescopes like um, itelescopes.net, you can use their telescope and look at some of these supernova also. And again, you could add your information to this list. So I'm going to try to upgrade. I'll try to update everybody on at least the number of supernova and uh, let you know if there's any reasonably magnet, uh, reasonably semi sort of barely bright ones uh, going off within, within the past week or so since uh, last broadcast. So that'd be another feature I'll be uh, putting on here on the radio show. Um, every, every week, just give you an idea at least, how many supernovas have been spotted? Still waiting for that good one here in uh, the Milky Way. Hasn't happened in a while. There's been a few of them. Uh, some that have been observed just before the advent of the telescope. Just before. Well, even with the, the earliest telescopes, doesn't mean they would see very much. Anyways, it would just look. It would look brighter in a in a telescope, even you know hundreds of years ago but now is when we really need a supernova close by in the milky way uh with all the telescopes out there we've got x-ray telescopes ultraviolet telescopes optical telescopes infrared telescopes we've got radio telescopes we got all kinds of telescopes out there uh and they really want to get some observations of a close by supernova uh, more data more resolution for the telescopes and really be able to uh, improve what's happening during uh, the different types of supernova explosions. So they generally say there should be one about every 100 years on average in a galaxy. And the last one's about 400 years ago. We're either way overdue for one or we're way overdue for four of them. Now that would be kind of nice too get four supernovas appearing in our skies. It'd be nice if it was somewhere, you know, celestial equator area, so everybody in the northern and southern hemisphere could observe it. The last one that was uh, pretty close was in the Large Magellanic Cloud that occurred in 1987. And that was only visible in the southern hemisphere. So, yeah, a lot of uh, northern hemisphere observatories were really kind of disappointed they didn't get a piece of that one. Large Magellanic Cloud is, um, oh, wait, okay, don't, don't do this now. My, my computer wants to uh, to update. So if, if I go bye-bye real quick, it's because my computer just updated itself without my permission. So we'll see what happens. All right, so hopefully we'll stick around. Oh, since we're on the Large Magellanic Cloud, I guess that'll be our, our object to talk about for for tonight, last last week we talked about uh, M33, the galaxy in Triangulum, one of the companion uh, galaxies of the local group. There's about 20 different galaxies associated with the, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, a little bit of controversy on the Magellanic clouds, or whether they really are companions to the Milky Way galaxy. Some thoughts are that they might be moving too fast to be basically orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. So that's kind of changed things around. Um, the Mil the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud is kind of a, a semi-spiral. There's sort of a barely a little bit of indication it's a spiral galaxy, a little bit of a bar to the center of it. That means that usually there's like, you know, a really round spot in the middle. Well, sometimes that round spot and blob in the middle has been, been stretched out on two sides, so it kind of forms a bar shape. Well, it definitely has a little bit of a bar shape to it, a little bit of a spiral shape to it. 
but definitely disrupted possibly by the small Magellanic Cloud, the other one that's nearby. Of course, so one of the most famous features in the Large Magellanic Cloud is a giant star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, where hydrogen gas is now collapsing and making a lot of brand new stars. And it's actually pretty visible in uh, small telescopes, binoculars, things like that. If you live in the in the southern hemisphere, it is pretty far down. Declination of of almost 70 degrees, so that means 20 degrees from the south celestial pole. That's, that's uh, pretty far south, so somewhere around, I, I can't see it, I looked up um, somewhere around, I think, Central America will start to pick it up from, from the North and South America, so somewhere around South Amer- uh, Central America will be able to start to, to pick, pick it up and see that far down. Large measure cloud is at a distance averaging a about 163,000 uh, light years away from us. A reason, I've seen it. It's it's not too bad. It's kind of a faint, fuzzy spot. So uh, if you're in some dark skies, it's pretty easy to see. It kind of looks like a little fuzzy cloud of stars in the, in the sky. Uh, get this circumpolar from most southern countries like uh, South America and Africa, Australia. Circumpolar never rises or sets. You get a little farther north, of course, it's going to rise and rise and set. Uh, it's actually um, in the nighttime sky now, so it's not in their southern hemisphere's daytime sky. So, in fact, if you uh, for northern hemisphere observers, if you uh, if you can find Orion the Hunter and go basically due south from Orion the Hunter, um, it kind of lines up with a large Magellanic cloud. It's got some interesting features in it. There's roughly 60 globular clusters in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Our own Milky Way has about maybe about 150 globular clusters, something like that. Uh, not a very, very big cluster. I think only about, uh, let's see, about 10 billion solar masses. It's only about uh, 14,000 light years in diameter compared to the Milky Way, which is um, 100,000 light years in diameter. It has uh, observable planetary nebula. So far, they've seen about 400 planetary nebula. A planetary nebula used to be a star, a star that used up its nuclear fuel, and the outer portions of the star basically swelled out, and the outer gases drifted out into space, uh, forming kind of a bubble uh, around what used to be the core of the star. The core is still lighting up that gas, um, but it's basically very, very wispy. It looks like a planet because it has a round shape to it when you look at it through a telescope. That's why it's called a planetary nebula, but the nebula part means it's just a cloud. So 400 of those uh, have been found in open clusters, stars that are associated with each other without any uh, particular shape to them. About 700 open clusters have been found inside the large Magellan cloud. Of course, lots of uh, giant and supergiant stars, and supergiant stars are usually the the blue ones, the blue white stars. And sometimes the red ones are also really really big too. So interesting thing to look at. I have seen it once about twenty years ago, and when I went down to see a solar eclipse in Bolivia, that was nineteen ninety four, something like that. Been a while. I'd like to get back there again. And go check it out. Again, you have to get there in the right time of year. Otherwise, it would be up in the, you know, higher up in the daytime. Not a good time to go see it. You want it when it's higher up at the nighttime sky. Uh, let's see what else we've got going on out here. Let's check their chat room. Make any questions? Mm, okay, nothing particular. A distant most distant black hole has been discovered. Uh, well, let me put this link. It is on the NASA website. You can go check that out yourself, but I'll put it into our chat room. And we'll also get these links into the Space Pirate Facebook page. Don't forget to uh, go and like the Space Pirate Facebook page because I try to put notices before um, the broadcast. So in case something happens that we, I know ahead of time that we won't be able to broadcast or even shortly before broadcast, we're not going to broadcast. I'll post that into the 
Space Pirate Facebook page. So give you an idea if you uh, you, know, if you want to st- stay up really late, listen to the show, or uh, if it's going to be a canceled show, just uh, um, skip it and go back out observing or go to bed, whatever you want. Oh, uh, this is a this is a pretty far black hole that's been discovered. Uh, discovered to be about now the discovered to be about thirteen billion light years ago. Sorry, light years away. So basically, yeah, we're looking at it uh, as it was thirteen billion years ago. It's still around. It st- must have obviously have changed by now. If we're we're closer to it, it must be much larger probably inside a very large galaxy right now. Uh, so the, the interesting parts of this is the size of the black hole compared to how long ago it was around. So basically, the very beginnings of uh, stars forming and black holes forming, not a whole lot of stuff out there back then. So finding one that Far back in time is a uh, something not quite expected. But figure the probabilities, yes, but uh, very very rare to have a fairly large black hole that forms very rather shortly after uh, the Big Bang. Because during the Big Big Bang, the first thing that basically was out there was just hydrogen, and it took a little while for the hydrogen to actually collect together. And form stars, and for the for the stars to actually shine, and then um, light up the light up the hydrogen that's in the in the universe, and allowing us to see it. So kind of, a, and then and then having enough material to actually collapse together to form a black hole. Uh, also, kind of a rare thing. And they're still trying to figure out what happened that made black holes form early on. They were thinking, well, maybe lots of really big stars formed. They collapsed and exploded and formed into black holes. They're all really close together and they you know, combined together. Or maybe just the gas collected together so fast because it was so close together that it didn't go into star formation. It went straight into black hole formation. Well, that doesn't happen now. That only happened in the very, very early universe. Uh, you can go to the uh, NASA website for that one. And I put the article into our uh, uh, chat room too. And those of you that want to uh, also look those articles up during the repeat time, you can go to the uh, Space Pirate Facebook page and the list of uh, articles will be there too. So you can either look at them while I'm uh, talking about them on repeat or you can look at them at, look at them at other times too. Uh, by the way, out there, all you listeners out there, I am looking for some more interesting web. I haven't put it in yet. Okay, sorry, sorry. That's what our chat our chat room is all uh, for. So let me put that article about the most distant black hole found into our chat room. Yeah, see, this how this is how the the chat room works. There we go. Oh boy, I'm getting some I'm getting some beeps. Do you think it's my computer trying to uh, mm, crash on me and 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 update? Ooh, we'll we'll see how how much longer I can go. All right, there it is, everybody. Yeah, let's see what some other interesting articles were coming up lately. All kinds of, kinds of oh, well, anyways, as I was saying, um, like I found that list of bright supernova. Uh, I've got a list of uh, objects that um, stars that the moon covers up. So if you've got some other favorite websites out there for things like that, uh, collect them together. And I'll mention it again. And if you can pop them into our pop them into our chat room, then you can um, pass them on to everybody else. And I'm interested in some stuff like. Stuff like that, too. So uh, anything that's kind of lists of interesting things for observations. Uh, there's a list of double stars, stuff like that. Uh, whatever you've got out there that's just um, catalog lists and things like that that make observations a little bit more interesting. I appreciate you to uh, appreciate you uh, putting them on. Oh, the, sh- the ship is... Rustling up against some rocks, I think. Hmm. 
All right, let's see what else we've got going on here. Some, always some interesting stuff. Uh, simulations. I don't do. There's an article on a simulation of how massive collisions delivered metal to the early Earth. Uh, I don't care that much for most simulation articles. Uh, something about oh, uh, uh, a uh, type of nitrogen molecule, been more not recently discovered, but it's been found to be more abundant in the Earth's upper atmosphere than previously thought. Uh, molecular nitrogen, where two nitrogen atoms are combined together, is pretty common stuff. It's what our most of our atmosphere is made of. Uh, this is a type of. There's also a type of nitrogen that has an extra um, neutron attached to it. That's called nitrogen 15. And what's really, really rare was uh, pairs of nitrogen 15 atoms combined together to make a molecule. Now, it's not that rare to have a nitrogen 15 with a regular nitrogen atom, which is a nitrogen 14 combined together, but definitely really, really rare to have two nitrogen 15 molecules combined together. Well, actually, they found basically double the amount let me put that article in our upper atmosphere. Let me put that article in our chat room here for everybody to read. So that's kind of a cool one, too. And how did that happen? Uh, better equipment. Where was that from? Was it UCLA? They got a, a better uh, instrument for measuring um, those chemicals in our atmosphere. I think it's the only one, in the, maybe the only one in the world. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Or, is it, is it, or was it just a researcher from UCLA? I'm trying to figure, read it real quick here. Sorry, it's hard to, hard to read and, and talk about the stuff at the same time. Um, but read the article. Wayways, the laboratory just got a, uh, uh, a much, much better piece of equipment that was able to um, find this molecule. And then they, they detected that it was like uh, about twice as twice the amount that was uh, recently predicted all right getting down to the end here about 10 more minutes where do we want to go all kinds of places all over the all over the world oh, let's see Is any, let me go back to our chat room make sure I didn't miss anything and we'll take a little look around what's up in the sky uh, as far as uh, general constellations and stuff like that for uh, mostly for northern hemisphere observers. All right, let me go to my um, let me go to my uh, star chart called Stellarium on the computer here. I always like to do that, figure out uh, just look around what's in the sky. Something I always like to check before I go out observing, uh, give me an idea of what constellations are out there, and also when I look up. Um, objects to look for. I like to find out how far above the horizon they are, how well they are placed in the evening sky or the morning sky. Sometimes I say, oh, look, there's a comet out there, and I'll look it up. It only rises at 4 o'clock in the morning. Definitely not something I tend to uh, stick around for anymore. And uh, and and step that late in the cold weather that we're having right now yeah we're northern hemisphere getting into the cold weather into the winter time southern hemisphere reporting optronics from buenos Aires reporting finally getting into some nicer warmer weather for observing of course you get nicer warmer weather but you also start to lose the nighttime skies too so as the northern hemisphere gets more nighttime we uh, get colder temperatures and vice versa always a trade-off it makes the, the spring and the fall i think one of the best times for observing everybody pretty much has an equal number of um, nighttime hours and the weather's moderate for both hemispheres so that's when you get the best observing in right now we're getting in the into the cold stuff so we're losing we know we still have um from the northern hemisphere a uh, asterism called uh, the uh, northern uh, sorry the summer triangle yeah we're done with summer but we still have the summer triangle which consists of the stars altair vega and deneb and Three different constellations of Deneb and Cygnus the Swan, Vega, the constellation of Lyra the Harp, and Altair in Aquila the Eagle. They all make a really nice, fairly large triangle in the nighttime sky. Um, fairly high in the western skies, 
getting ready to set a few hours after the sun goes down. Early part of the evening, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, something like that. Uh, prominent constellation, uh, high uh, along the meridian. The meridian's a line between north and south. It passes straight overhead. So basically the highest part of the sky is the constellation of Pegasus. And the main feature of Pegasus is a really large square of stars. Pretty easy to see and pretty big. Um Fairly prominent, and it actually it's called the flying horse, and it actually goes off to a fairly bright star called Enif. That's kind of a, a favorite one of mine. And Enif is a good place to find one of the uh, globular clusters that are visible this time of year, and that globular cluster is called M15. A pretty nice one to see. And the stars of the head of Pegasus actually kind of point right towards M15. So that's always a nice one and reasonably easy to find because it has some nice pointer stars going going right towards it. Uh, a little bit south of M15, but uh, in a little bit more of a star-obscured area is M2, also a pretty nice globular cluster, pretty easy to see. Both of them are right around 6th, 7th magnitude, so just beyond... Um, visibility to the naked eye, but very easy to see with a pair of binoculars. So you'll find them as uh, tiny little fuzzy spots. The darker the skies you have, the more prominent they are. But uh, both objects are really nice to look at through a, a small telescope and pretty easy to resolve the stars in either one of those globular clusters. Those are the prominent globular clusters in the early part of the evening this time of year. So we've got a few of them around there, not, not quite so many right now. Uh, the Milky Way, again from the northern hemisphere, is, is passing basically uh, high overhead, but from east to west. And we're getting toward the area where we're looking towards the outer portion of the Milky Way. And I finally looked it up. I was going to look this up um, last week, and I never never did get to uh, report it, but Right now, uh, where are we at? 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the evening, oh, 9 o'clock in the evening. i got my, my thing set for, my uh, star chart set for, um, is right where the area of the opposite part of the center of the Milky Way galaxy is basically looking to the opposite direction along the galactic equator, uh, 180 degrees from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. If you want to know which way is straight out, along the plane of the galaxy. It, it's near the constellation of Auriga, and it's near the second brightest star in Auriga called Alnath. So if you find the star called Alnath in the constellation of Auriga, and just a few degrees towards the east is basically galactic longitude 180, the opposite from uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy and along the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Along the, the whole Milky Way galaxy, stretching from east to the west, this is a great place for looking at open clusters, if you like looking at open clusters. Uh, stars that form small groups of the sky, they're actually usually all associated with each other. Um, Generally formed at about the same time, still still together, a loose organization. Not like the globular clusters. The globular clusters are, are ball-shaped groups that are fairly compact and contain quite a few stars. The open clusters can be anywhere from a few dozen stars to a few hundred stars. Generally not a thousand stars, but several hundred stars all, all together. And they mostly lie right along the plane of the Milky Way galaxy because... That's basically us looking into the thickest parts of our Milky Way galaxy itself. So that's where you'll actually be able to see um, most of the open clusters. And there's some fairly nice ones. Again, in the constellation of Auriga, uh, really nice open clusters to go look at. So go look, just a good time to do that uh, open cluster viewing time. Some open clusters, not too impressed with. They look more like, um, you know background star so not that interesting some of them are pretty nice to see all right just about time to get out of here so time for me to say goodbye to everybody in our chat room really appreciate you being in here tonight of course when you're in our chat room we uh, consider you part of our space prior crew so glad to have you here 
Thanks, everybody, that's been joining me tonight. Uh, don't forget, we got more programming coming up. Astronomy Ireland, Planetary Radio, Planetary Scientists, Naked Astronomer, Naked Scientists, all coming up after Space Pirate Radio. So three more hours of programming, and then we repeat everything for the next four hours. So appreciate everybody being here. Uh, back again next week. Hopefully, Diane will get her technology issues solved. I'm sure she'll have no problem with that. We'll see you all again next week. All right, time for me to head out. Thanks, everybody, and good night, all. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of Astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the voice of astronomy around the world and across the known universe. This is astronomy.fm radio. AFM.